Hello and good evening, friends. Welcome to the lockdown lecture series organized by the Lady Lawyers Association. In these testing times, of course, for the benefit of one and all. I am sure all of us are praying for the death of coronavirus, and therefore, we thought it fit, or rather, most appropriate, to share and discuss the topic of drafting and proving of wills. And to enlighten us on this topic, today we have with us Ms. Farzana Bairam Kamdeen, an advocate and solicitor and managing partner of Messrs. FZBN Associates, a firm which was started by her in 2005. Not to forget that before this, Farzana had a long career as a partner of Vadia Gandhi and Company for almost 13 years. Farzana has a vast experience of handling various matters in civil litigation, non-lit matters, corporate matters, arbitrations, for more than three decades, we can say. She has been appearing as an arguing counsel in High Court, Supreme Court, DRT, NCLT, Charity Commissioner. You name the court, and I'm sure we'll find her presence there by way of number of reported judgments to her credit. I think a must mention achievement which I should make and which I cannot forget is that she stood first in the solicitor's exams, which was held by Bombay Incorporated Law Society, and that too in the first attempt. She has received the best speaker award in the All India Moot Court competition held by the Bar Council of India. Well, the list seems endless. So I think instead of wasting time, I should call upon Farzana. But before that, for, for the participants, may I just say this, that whatever questions you want to put in, on the left-hand side of your screen, you will see three dots. You just have to click those three dots and enter your questions. Just type your questions, and your questions will be answered after Farzana has completed her session. Thank you so much, participants, and please bear with us. Farzana, may I request you to take over from here now? Are you there, Farzana? Yes. Thank you, Mamda, for your kind words. Uh, today, I've been invited to speak on drafting and proving of unprivileged wills. An unprivileged will is basically one which can be made by any individual who is not an army man, who is not a sailor, who is not a airman. It is the common man who makes unprivileged wills. Now, who can therefore make an unprivileged will? Any person of sound mind who is not a minor, who knows what he is doing, can make a will. The person can be a married woman who can make a will with regard to her own estate. It can be an insane person who in a lucid interval can make a will. It can also be a deaf, dumb or blind person who can make a will, provided they understand what they are signing or on which a mark is being affixed. Therefore, any person of sound mind having testamentary capacity can make a will. Now, when a client approaches you to make a will, what will you first do? Will you just take his instructions and therefore go about making a will? A will is not a format document. Yes, there are certain clauses which are commonly used in wills. But it is not a cut paste job that you have to do. You have to take complete instructions because the will will speak after the death of the testator. The person executing is known as the testator. Therefore, you would inquire from your client who is his family? What, who are the members that comprise his family? Is it wife and children? Are there parents? Are there nephews and nieces? Whoever is relevant for the purpose of the will, you need to know his general family so that you can understand whether any of these family members are capable of challenging the will at a later date. And you can advise him accordingly. Next, you will inquire is what are the broad assets that this testator has? And this is important from the perspective of identifying what he holds. Many people hold movable and immovable properties in joint names. They have multiple holdings. You don't need to know all the assets, especially not the movables, because if they are 
assets which are investments like mutual funds, fixed deposits, shares, etc. They will change throughout the lifetime of the testator. But immovable properties, I would recommend that you find out the details. You find out the proper description of, say, a flat that he holds. Who are the co-owners? Or are there joint owners? A joint owner cannot bequeath her flat. It would go to the survivor. However, co-ownership can be, it, a flat can be held in different uh, proportions. So therefore, your testator may hold 50% or may hold 70% whereas his other co-owner may hold the balance. So please identify, please inquire. A testator will possibly have shown in his tax return what is his holding pattern. Your will should not, therefore, deal with property which belongs to somebody else. So please make the inquiry. Next, you find out who are the beneficiaries that the testator wants to leave things to. Are there any minors? This is necessary from the perspective of what I will talk about later, bequest to minors, whether trusts have to be created. So therefore, please inquire whether who are the beneficiaries, who is the residue legatee, etc. Then we come to the question of uh, bequest. Please inquire whether he wishes to leave an absolute bequest to somebody or he wishes to leave a life interest. The simplest form of uh, leaving a bequest is leaving an absolute bequest. But I will deal with that when I come to bequests. Now, having taken these instructions, you will start drafting the will. Now, each will, as I said, has certain basic clauses. Uh, they can, of course, be modified depending on the circumstances and the instructions given. Your first clause normally is the executor clause. It is recommended that every will must have an executor. And why is that? That is basically because probate is given only to an executor named in a will. If you go after the deceased, after the testator dies, when you go to seek probate of a will, the high court will give it only to a person who is named as an executor. There can be multiple executors, in which case you can specify all the executors, all can apply for probate. Now, an executor is also a person you trust. So you have to inquire from the testator who he is comfortable with and who he believes will act as per his wishes and who he believes will execute his wishes as per what he has directed. Therefore, please identify an executor or executor and make the testator identify and put the names. Uh, the other benefit of having an executor is that all the intermediate acts that an executor does pending the probate get, get approved as soon as probate is granted. It is only when probate is not granted then the act of an executor can be challenged. So it, the property vests in an executor as on date of death and the executor can apply for probate and all intermediate acts can be validated once probate is obtained. Now, there was a client, uh, a matter which I'm handling just now of the famous author Mulkraj Anand, where he has appointed multiple executors with regard to different parts of his will. So therefore, for his Delhi properties, he appoints X, Y, Z. For his Bombay properties, he appoints A, B, C. For his books and the uh, royalty receivable from these books, he appoints some other people. Now, that is possible. I have followed this when I made the will of another famous author. The same uh, person appointed with regard to his mobile investments, a certain executor with regard to his other royalties from his books, somebody else with regard to the charitable bequest, some third person. So therefore, please appoint an executor. Now we come to funeral expenses. Why must we specify funeral expenses, either in general terms or in specific terms? Because a funeral expense that the high court presently allows is 2,500 rupees that the high court will allow you to sanction. But if there is a sum mentioned in the will, the executor will be able to justify having spent more. 
Of course, if the executor has preserved bills that he has preserved for all the expenses he incurred for the funeral, he may be able to convince the High Court by filing an affidavit along with the bills as supporting proof that he has spent so much money and that amount may be sanctioned by the High Court. But even uh, without that, it may be possible that you may be able to justify it to a beneficiary because the will specifies the funeral expense. We now come to the question of ownership of property. As I mentioned earlier, that is essential to find out because under a will, you cannot bequeath something which is not yours. If you do, then the will is subject to challenge and you would have a difficulty in trying to justify that. A separate suit would have to be filed, etc., because the probate court does not go into questions of title. So therefore, please find out and try and keep the challenges limited and therefore specify what is the share of a testator in property which he is bequeathing if he is not the sole owner. Coming to bequests, the simplest form, as I said earlier, is an absolute bequest. An absolute bequest is one where an unrestricted right or the whole interest in a property is given to the testator, uh, given by the testator to a beneficiary. This absolute bequest cannot have conditions imposed on it. So you cannot say, for example, that I give absolutely to X, Y, Z a sum of 10 lakhs of rupees. But from the 10 lakhs, the person will buy, for example, a car, example, a house, and the rest he can deal with what he wants. An absolute bequest is one which is given absolutely in the sense that the beneficiary is entitled to use it in any manner that he wants. However, there can be a life interest imposed prior to an absolute bequest. So therefore, if you are staying in a house and your wife also stays with you or your husband stays with you, you may want to protect that beneficiary. And you will therefore provide that during the lifetime of the spouse, that spouse will have a life interest and only thereafter will an absolute bequest be given to your children. That is what is basically called a life interest. Now, there are bequests which can be in the nature of trust. I'll give you an example. If a testator comes to you and says that I have multiple children, a child who is age five years, a child who is age 10 years, a child who is age 15 years, does the testator want to leave things absolutely to those children? He, of course, hopes to survive for many years after he makes the will. And from your perspective, it is a good thing that he survives for a long length of time. But do you not want to protect uh, the inheritance to the extent that don't you want, or doesn't the testator want those children to stand on, his, on her or his own two feet? And therefore, the way around it is, to provide that till they attain a certain age, till they attain, say, the age of 25, till you believe that the education is over and things are complete, that a trust is created and the trustees or the executor appointed under the will can administer the estate for, um, the, ben for the benefit of such children. Now, the trustee can be the executor or it can be some other individual. It can be the, um, the other parent. It can be a friend. It can be anybody. So the words you would normally use in regard to leaving things upon trust would be to say that I give up to my executor or trustee upon trust for the benefit of my son X till he attains the age of, say, 25 years, in which period you hope that he will have been able to finish his education, stand on his own two feet. Therefore, we talk about leaving bequests upon trust. These are all permissible. You can create a private trust by your will. You can create, you can direct that part of your estate is given to charity. And 
your executor will execute your charitable bequest by giving it for the education of poor, giving it for the education of children, giving it for uh, medical expenses or whatever that the testator wants. Now, if you, for example, give an absolute bequest, that means you give absolutely. Can you impose a condition on such an absolute bequest? Can you say that I give you 10 lakhs of rupees, but out of the 10 lakhs, which I give to you absolutely, but out of the 10 lakhs, you will use 1 lakh of rupees to buy a house, 50,000 you will give to charity, and the rest you can do with what you wish. No, you cannot. The Indian Succession Act says that any condition imposed on an absolute bequest is void, and the bequest will take effect, the condition will not. The condition will have no effect. Now, coming to specific legacies, what are specific legacies? Specific legacies is, I, you don't say when you give a bequest that I give you money. You specify how much money you give. You do not say I give you my watch. If you have multiple watches, it is not clear as to which watch you wish to give. Therefore, please specify. A bequest in, an al in the alternative is, for example, a bequest which will read like this. I give device and bequeath to my son a sum of rupees 2 lakhs in the event of his predeceasing me. I give device and bequeath to my daughter the same sum of 2 lakhs. So it's a bequest in the alternative. Or you say that I give device and bequeath to X and in the event, provided he is married. And if he is not married, I give device and bequeath to Y. So you could do a variety of bequests in the alternative. Now, when a bequest does not specify what is it given for or where it is a specified amount, it's a bequest which is void for uncertainty. Now, wills, very often there have been clients who have come to me and said, that, look, I had made a will earlier and I want to revise my will. I want to change it. Would you please have a look. Can you please guide me for making a new will? We have always looked at the older wills to see that what parts of the will the client wants to change. Sometimes clients write their own wills. They forget that whilst they are detailing the specific requests that they wish to make, they sometimes forget that their estate will change over the period of years that they continue to live after making the will. And therefore, it is necessary to provide for a residuary clause, which provides that the rest and residue of my estate, of what nature and kind soever, and wheresoever situate, whether it's movable or immovable, will go, will be bequeathed to X, Y, or Z, or to a defined person, or to defined individuals. A residue can therefore be not only to one person, it can to be to multiple people all having equal shares, or if they're sharing in different proportions, then you can specify that giving 20% to Mr. X, 50% to Mr. Y, and the balance to Mr. Z. So that is basically the bequest of a residue. Now coming to the bequest to an executor. I told you earlier that it is the Indian Succession Act allows you to have a beneficiary being an executor. So therefore, your children are the executors of your will. They are also your beneficiaries. But one child goes to live abroad. On your death, he's not there. He does not come to probate the will. He leaves it on the other children to probate the will. He does not even manifest an intention to act as executor. He tells his siblings, look, you are in India. Please go ahead and probate the will. He renounces probate. Will he get the bequest? No, the bequest to him will fail. How will you secure that the bequest will not fail, considering that he is your beneficiary and you want to see that he gets that portion of the estate? The only way that you can secure that is to provide a clause in the will, which will basically say that the bequest is made to my executors in their personal capacity and not in their capacity as executors. And the bequest 
will go to these executors regardless of whether or not they probate the will, prove the will, or manifest an intention to do so. If you put such a clause in the will, the beneficiary will be safeguarded, and regardless of whether or not the beneficiary proves the will, the bequest will take effect. However, we come to the question of attesting witness. If an attesting witness is a beneficiary, whatever you may provide in the will, the Indian Succession Act clearly provides that the bequest will fail. The attestation will be held to be valid. The bequest to the beneficiary will fail if the beneficiary or the spouse of the beneficiary have attested the will. So please be very, very careful when you have when a will is attested. Please advise the testator to ensure that no beneficiary or spouse of a beneficiary signs the will as an attesting witness. Now we come to execution. So basically, you have finished the drafting of the will. You now come to the question of execution. How does an executor execute the will? There is no special form of execution which has to be followed. There is no particular mode. He can sign it in his normal signature. He can put his mark. I had a client once who came. He was a merchant navy. He was a sailor on, he was a captain of a uh, ship. He came not to sign a will, he came to sign a document. And what amazed me, I was very young at that time, was after signing, he was wearing a ring which had a seal. And he took the ring and he put the seal on the document. That was the first time and the last time that I've seen it. But it is a mark which can be identified with that gentleman, and he can only affix his mark. The Indian Succession Act allows you to affix a mark on a will also. A testator can affix his mark. However, if the testator makes another individual sign the will, that individual, on the direction of the executor and in his presence, can sign the will on behalf of the executor, but he cannot affix a mark. Now, this signature that the executor makes must be attested by two witnesses, a will along with a mortgage is a compulsory attestable document. Therefore, two witnesses are compulsory for a valid execution of a will. The witnesses can be anybody so long as they are not beneficiaries or spouse of beneficiaries. Even in that case, the attestation will be valid. The witnesses must see either the executor signing or get an acknowledgement for the executor. Uh, the testator must tell him that I have signed this will, even if he doesn't sign in their presence. But the testator must be present when each of the witnesses signs. So therefore, though it is not required, for an attesting witness to see the testator signing or fixing his mark, or see the other person who signs on behalf of the testator uh, signing, it is necessary for the attesting witness to get an acknowledgement from the testator that it is his signature or mark, or the signature of the other person who has signed at his request. Therefore, the concept of within eyesight the concept being that the testator must be within the eyesight of the attesting witness when he signs the will uh, as an attesting witness. But it is not necessary for an attesting witness, that for both attesting witnesses to remain present at the same time while attesting a will. So the testator can come to your house, get, it, get you to attest his will. He can then go to a solicitor's office and tell the solicitor that, look, I have signed this will. Please, could you sign it? And the solicitor could sign it. Both attesting witnesses do not have to be present at the same time. Now, I will get into details of attestation and how important it is 
a little while later when I talk about proving of bills. But let us finish with execution and attestation. Uh, once you have drafted the will and a client comes, for example, there are clients who will attest the will and execute it without your presence. But many clients will come to you and say, we want you to be an attesting witness. Now, if a client signs in front of you, this is something I have learned over the years. That very often, it's a good thing if clients survive for a long time after you have done their will. But if and when they finally expire and the will has to be probated, you, an attesting witness is required to sign an affidavit. It's a compulsory thing which has to be annexed to the probate petition. You may have signed the will as an attesting witness when you are 30. Your client may have expired when you are 70. You may recollect nothing. You may not recollect, you may re recollect that he was your client. You may not recollect the circumstances. And if you don't recollect the circumstances, and if you are so unfortunate as to have that will challenged, and you have to step in the, into the witness box to give evidence to prove the execution and the attestation of the will, I'm sorry to say you will remember nothing. So now, over the years, having done testamentary matters, having seen the difficulty that attesting witnesses face, having experienced how frustrating it is when attesting witnesses have come and actually given me information and explained to me how the attestation took place. And they have done that of their own free will. They have been friends of the uh, testator. And how after I have made their affidavits in cross-examination because they could not answer questions. For example, who was in the room at the same time? Did you Were you there before the next attesting witness or were you there after? What position were you sitting on the sofa in a particular place? Wills have been disbelieved. Evidence of attesting witnesses have been disbelieved. I had a case where the attesting witness was an old lady. She knew, she spoke fluent Gujarati. She came to me. Initially, she was brought by the executor of the will, an old gentleman. She came to me. She said, yes, I have seen this testator making the will. I treat, I'm, an unmarried, I'm a married woman, but I have no children. He was like my son. I used to go to the executor's house regularly because his daughter used to teach me English. So I can read and write English, but I can't understand complicated words. I drafted her affidavit. She was the one who gave me instructions. She detailed the instructions. She told me I went on so and so date. I was told by the testator that I'm making my will. Will you please sign? I signed it. There was another gentleman who also stays in our colony. I, he was also there. I never, unfortunately, asked who came into the room first, who sat on which side of the sofa, who else was there. Did you read the will? I asked her the general questions we ask when we draft wills of attesting witnesses. And I put it all down on paper. When I made her read that English thing, explained it to her. She signed in English. I did not think it necessary at that stage to have the affidavit translated. So I used words like sound disposing state of mind, that the testator was in sound disposing state of mind. I used the words like testamentary capacity. Ultimately, in cross-examination, these were the words she was asked to explain. So though there was a translator present, she was unable to explain in Gujarati what the English words meant. And despite her being present in court, despite her being offered as a witness to the learned judge, and the learned judge being told that you can question her if you like, and despite the learned judge being able to see that she was getting very agitated when arguments were being raised and it was being said in 
of course, all arguments in English, which she could understand. Though she was not very fluent in the language, she could understand it perfectly. She was getting very agitated that her testimony was not being believed. The learned judge chose not to question her and decided to disbelieve her evidence. After that, I have learned my lesson. So therefore, when we, after we finish execution and attestation of wills, we have started a practice of recording the execution in letters, which we send to the testator. And we keep in our files so that 20 years later, we remember who had accompanied the testator and where the will was signed and in what circumstances it was signed. Now, let us therefore go to the question of proving of wills. As I mentioned earlier, a will is proved by an, a petition being filed. A petition is normally filed by the executor because the High Court rule says the probate of a will will be granted to the executor. If there is no executor, a residuary or a universal legatee will file the will. Uh, sorry, file for uh, letters of administration with will annexed. There are forms prescribed under the High Court rules as to what you have to file with these petitions. One of the requirements is the affidavit of the attesting witness. Now, rule 100, form 102 of the High Court rules specifies the form in which an attesting witness will file an affidavit. This came up for consideration before my Lord, Mr. Justice Patel, in the matter of Mukesh Chadda versus Dheeraj Lal Chadda. And the learned judge went into the question of whether or not the affidavit, the format of the affidavit prescribed in the High Court rules is correct, whether that is sufficient. And he held that that format has a very crucial error in as much as it requires that both attesting witnesses have remained present at the same time. So he finally held that that creates lots of difficulties because sometimes the department does not accept an affidavit which is in a different matter, manner. And therefore, it is necessary that you specify in an affidavit which is greater in detail. It's more like an affidavit in evidence. It specifies who was present, who signed the will, who got uh, whether the testator signed in your presence, did not sign in your presence, make it like an evidence affidavit so that at the time of cross-examination, there are no discrepancies and it can be accepted and it will not create difficulty in cross-examination. The order, therefore, directs the department to accept such affidavits if filed. Therefore, if the format affidavit does not meet your requirements or your the particulars in the matter are different. Please go into the nitty gritties, put in some more detail. You may not get into, you may not file an affidavit that runs into 20 pages, but please put in the basic ingredients of section 63, uh, subsection C of the Indian Succession Act, which talks about how attestation is to be done. Now, coming to changes or interlineations or alterations or cancellations made in a will, obliterations made in a will, those must be signed by the testator and the attesting witnesses and must be explained in the will itself. Very often we make the testator write the date on which he's signing. That must in the margin be signed by him and it must be signed by the testing witnesses and explained at the time it is executed. Now, therefore, proof of attestation and execution is absolutely crucial and you have to do it properly. Let's come to the next slide. One second. Yes. Now, the burden of proof, of proving a will, what does an executor who applies for probate have to do? What is the burden cast on him? He basically has to prove mainly three things. That the will is 
validly executed and properly executed as per section 63 of the Indian Succession Act. It is validly attested as per section 63C of the Indian Succession Act. And that the testator knew that it, he, what he was signing was his will, that he was of sound, disposing state of mind, and that he had the testamentary capacity to do so. Now, these are absolutely the basic basic ingredients that the executor has to first prove. That is the principal onus that the executor must discharge. Now, therefore, I had a very uh, interesting case, which landed up in the reported judgment in Shobhna Shah versus Sangeeta Purbandawala. I had two attesting witnesses, one a solicitor and one a doctor. Both attesting witnesses admitted their signature on the will. But the story that they set up, or their version of what happened on the date of execution, was different from the version that was given by the propounder of the will, the executor of the will, who was the wife of the deceased. Her version was that she went along with the deceased to the residence of the solicitor, the solicitor took out the will from his cupboard. He thereafter called the doctor who was his friend. The doctor came to the residence of the solicitor. And then all four of the, uh, and the three of them signed, the testator, the two attesting witnesses, and the uh, wife was present at the time of the signature. However, the version given by the attesting witnesses was different. The version given was that it was the wife of the testator, who went to the office of the solicitor, requested the solicitor to sign the will. The testator was a friend and client of the solicitor. So the solicitor called up the testator, asked him, have you signed this will? And he was told that, yes, you have signed this will. I have signed this will, please attest it. And therefore he attested. He thereafter called the doctor and requested the doctor to attest the will. But he, the doctor did not know the testator. The wife of the testator thereafter went to the doctor's clinic. The doctor was given a number by the wife. And the doctor called the number, spoke to a gentleman who identified himself as the testator, and who said that, yes, this is my signature. Please sign. Did the court believe the evidence of the testing witnesses? The court not only believed the uh, evidence of the testing witnesses, but it held that that was not sufficient attestation as required under Section 63C of the Indian Succession Act, because though an acknowledgment had been given by the testator of the signature, the testator was not within the eyesight of the attesting witnesses, and had the attesting witnesses had not signed in his presence. On that basis, the attestation was held to be not validly done and the will was held to be not a validly executed will and though it was propounded by the wife who was the executor that this was actually the will of the deceased her version was not believed because under section 71 of the indian evidence act if attesting witnesses do not deny their signature no other evidence can be led, and the attesting witnesses in this matter had not denied signature. Now, this, this is something which you must therefore remember that attestation must happen in the presence of the testator or within his eyesight. Now, the other burden which lies on a uh, executor to prove or the propounder of the will to prove is what are called suspicious circumstances. What is a suspicious circumstance? I have set out a few points in the PPT and I will not waste time going on each of them. These are set out in the landmark case of H. Venkatachala Iyengar, where the Supreme Court laid down that certain things are treated as suspicious circumstances. For example, a shaky signature. Is it the signature of the deceased testator or an unnatural will? where he leaves out, he has four children. He gives only to one child. 
he does not leave to the others. Is this not something which is unnatural? Why would he deprive three children out of one? I had a matter recently where this was debated at length. The deceased was an old lady who died when she was 92. She made a will in her 70s. In that will, she provided that she was leaving things only to one of her sons with whom she was staying. The argument raised by the KVA towards the defendants was that the son influenced her, exercised undue influence, was a beneficiary, was a, he and his family were the principal beneficiaries of the will. And despite there being three other sons, the will had neglected all of them and none of them were provided for. Justice Patel, while deciding that matter, upheld the will on the ground that the testator had set out in the will circumstances why she was leaving out the other three children. She had set out that they had litigated with her and there were court proceedings pending for several years after her husband had died. And they had all tried to grab his estate. And the only child who supported her was this one son with whom she lived. And the will was ultimately upheld. We could prove that the execution had happened validly. It had been validly attested that the solicitor who had attested the will, along with the doctor who was present at the same time, all had attested the will at the same time. And therefore, attestation was proved, mental capacity was proved, and it was proved that though the son who was beneficiary was the major beneficiary, he had not participated in the will. And even if he had participated, his role was not such that it was a suspicious circumstance, which the onus of which was not discharged. And ultimately, the will was proved and probate granted. Now, I would like to briefly read what the tests are, has set out in the judgment of Pendock, versus, Pendock Barry versus James Butlin. And it is very interesting, the rules of law which have been followed by the Privy Council and which have been laid and followed by Venkatachala, Iyengar, and various other courts. These rules are two. The judgment says this. These rules are two. The first, that the onus probandi lies in every case upon the party propounding a will. And he must satisfy the conscience of the court that the instrument so propounded in the, is the last will of a free and capable testator. The second is that if a party writes or prepares a will under which he takes a benefit, that is a circumstance that ought generally to excite the suspicion of the court and calls upon it to be a vigilant and jealous in examining the evidence in support of the instrument in favor of which it ought not to pronounce unless the suspicion is removed and is judicially satisfied that the paper propounded does express the true, true will of the deceased. Now, if you read the judgment of Venkatachala Ayengar of the Supreme Court, which I would highly recommend, it specifies that a court must look at suspicious circumstances with care and try and examine the truth. But it is not such a rule that all, there must be complete skepticism, that all versions put to a dispel those suspicious circumstances have to be ignored. So what is required is the court must never close its mind to the truth. It must be vigilant, cautious, and circumspect. That is the words that the Supreme Court has used. When the Now, if all these three circumstances are satisfied, you have proved due execution, you have proved testamentary capacity, you have proved, dispelled all suspicious circumstances, you have generally proved the will. The, now the burden, the onus will shift on the caveator or the defendant to prove for fraud, coercion, undue influence, all of which can 
dislodge a will and make it void if proved. I will not go into all that. There are several judgments. Each of them have to be seen on the own facts of the case and each of them, but there is a very little time. So I do not, I cannot go into that. I, I can always go into it in question and answers if anybody is interested. Now, the last point I would like to state, which is slightly beyond the topic, which we have of proving of wills. That is protection of the estate by an executor. And I'll very briefly touch on it. When I was a young solicitor, I have seen many multiple matters in which we used to file motions, notice of the motion, an interim application, judge's orders, requesting the executor, requesting the court that there is a danger of somebody trying to take charge of some property, dispose it of, etc. I, as the executor, must protect that property. Please grant me receiver. Please grant me injunction. So, uh, and orders used to get passed in probate petitions. Following these proceedings, I filed a notice of motion in the matter of Rupali Mehta versus Tina Mehta. And at the ad interim stage, I got an order restraining the defendant from disposing of the flat in which she stayed, which belonged to the deceased, according to me. The matter came up for final hearing before Justice Deshmukh. And despite my best efforts in arguments, the learned judge finally held against me on the ground that the probate court, and I have no uh, quarrel with that proposition, that the probate court does not go into questions of title. This is a well-settled proposition in law. It is set out in recent judgments also, and there are many earlier judgments also, which set out the probate court does not go into questions of title. And therefore, if I have any issues with regard to protecting the property, I must file an administration suit with regard to that and seek orders for appointment of receiver under order 39, for or, uh, appointment of receiver under order 40 of the Civil Procedure Court and order 39 for injunction under the Civil Procedure Court. I think that is uh, all I have to say. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. It's been a real pleasure addressing this webinar. Thank you. Mamta, are you there? Uh. Uh, yeah, I can see Mamta. I will ask a question or two till she comes on board. Sure. Uh, this is Anita. Yeah, I know. First question is who pays the court fees for filing a probate petition? Does the executor from his own pocket? Uh, the court fees are normally paid by the executor. They are paid uh, from the estate of the deceased. So what we recommend to an executor is to take charge of the assets because he can take charge of the assets even pending probate. And open an executor's account, transfer monies from wherever there are monies lying in a bank account, transfer to an executor's bank account, and from that make expenses. If he cannot do so, for whatever reason, then he can reimburse himself once probate is obtained. OK, the second question is, there are two executors of a will. If an executor has transferred property to a beneficiary in accordance with the will before filing a probate petition, what happens to the property already transferred in the event the court comes to a decision that the will is not genuine? 
if firstly let me say that an executor is entitled to deal with the estate pending probate he however runs the risk of probate not being granted so if probate was granted all intermediate acts under section 2 to 7 of the indian succession act would be valid however if probate is not granted then he would have to make good to the estate any loss suffered by the estate on account of acts done by him in the interim period okay this question the next is can unfair distribution of estate among children be a sole ground for challenging the will i think you had explained this but anyway uh but briefly yes it can be a ground for challenging the will you will have to dispel the suspicious circumstances the propounder will have to dispel uh there are lots of judgments of them uh, deal with it on its own facts the case uh if you manage to show undue influence etc then yes sir, you can dislodge the will if the other requirements are not satisfied can a dispute in respect of a will be settled in a court yes of course it can be settled in a court but uh normally you would say that the will when we file settlements in matters the will is the will is the wishes of the testator and therefore there is a argument saying that you cannot do something different from the wishes of the testator ultimately we find some work around do a family settlement do something by which we probate the will but we provide that it will be implemented in a different manner and we have filed settlements like that fortunately such settlements have not been challenged thereafter uh what happens if one or both witnesses predecease the testator if one or more witnesses if both witnesses are not available then the will under the high court rules can be proved through any person who was in the room at the same time and saw the testator and the attesting witnesses sign so evidence can be filed of the person present if there is no such person present then anybody who is familiar with the handwriting of the testator and of the attesting witnesses can give evidence and it can be proved in normal course by comparison of signatures and things like that do you need to set out an amount in the will for the purpose of the funeral can it be a generic statement stating that as much as the executor deems fit yes you can make a general statement uh there's one more question and then i think we should one minute i'm just sure please recite again the citation of the case adjudicated by the honorable justice patel where the testator bequeath to only one of his several children uh the citation is neeta sangvi versus harkisanda sangvi and uh you will find that it's an unreported judgment of the bombay high court dated 12 september 2017 okay uh if there are different executors appointed for different properties as you mentioned then what happens of all if all cannot apply for probate at the same time what then, sorry, sorry it's not over sorry, finish, finish. what if one reserves his rights what if one renounces his executorship how is the probate to be granted in this circumstances uh when if there are multiple executors and few of them do not wish to join probate then citation is served by the high court upon them uh and they have a period of time within which to respond if they do not respond then probate will be granted to the executor applying reserving the right of the other executor to join probate at a later date 
If, however, an executor wants to not act as an executor, he can renounce probate and an affidavit to that effect if filed in the High Court. Probate will be granted unlimited to the executor who has applied. Uh, I think this will be the last question we'll take because of lack of time. If the previous will is registered and the codicil or the subsequent will is not registered, is such a codicil or new will that is not registered valid? Yes, it is valid because there is no compulsory requirement in law for a will to be registered. And so long as you will say in the beginning that I have made an earlier will and I revoke all my earlier wills or earlier codices, then it is very clear that the will stands revoked. Thank you so much, Shaltana, for this lovely, entertaining, enlightening lecture that you have given us. Thank uh, you so now much. I call upon uh, Ms. Jeta Das to give the word of thanks. Uh, Ms. Farzana Behram Kamni, thank you so much for your time that you have uh, invested in preparing the PowerPoint as well as uh, you have explained some of the details so simply with practical examples. So have, it has given us a better understanding of uh, how to draft a will, which I would say is not only, uh, should I say, easier, not only as a legal professional, but even as an individual who would look at the different aspects of drafting a will. So we thank you again for your time. And uh, we would also like to thank uh, Jump Talk, who have uh, helped us host this webinar today. And Mr. Harsh Sabale, uh, who from Jump Talk, who has taken a lot of time to explain to us how we should utilize this platform. Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. And uh, even if there are some questions which we have not been able to answer due to lack of time, we hope to see your participation again the next time. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. It's been a real pleasure to be addressing this webinar. And thank you, Harsh.